Well, good morning. I'm the Reverend Dr. William L. Johnson III, the chaplain here at Christian Hospital Northeast, uh, a palliative care chaplain indeed. I am so grateful for your presence indeed for being here with us as always. We're grateful for you. Uh, we want you to know that you are loved, appreciated, and you're irreplaceable. And because of that, uh, these messages have been prepared just for you. Uh, we are aware that life sometimes comes with twists and turns, difficulties and challenges, ups and downs, hardships sometimes, sometimes great successes. And along the way, we need those who would journey with us to encourage us along the way and to inspire us. And that's why we offer these messages. Um, over a year ago, uh, it was put in my, in my heart, my mind, and my spirit as we were going through the throes of a pandemic uh, to offer these messages to uh, those who are our caregivers and those in the hospital and to our patients and their families, uh, those who could not uh, find inspiration in our chapel here um, because we could not open. And in many ways, those we probably would never reach um, that now we have the opportunity to touch and to inspire and hopefully to encourage. So thank you so much uh, for joining us and to being, uh, being a part of this um, morning meditation family. Today's morning meditation is entitled, Who's to Say? Who's to Say? It is often and more often than not something that we always don't always have a chance to address or think of that offers us opportunity to offer these words of encouragement. We have found that we search uh, and we seek for clues about who we are often uh, because in a world full of changing dynamics, we are often searching for our own identities of who we are and who uh, we want to be. And in fact, uh, those questions often come up. We seek for clues about who we are, what we, we are, where we're from, uh, or the people we'll be around. We want to know from them and all the circumstances around us, what really has meaning in our lives. And so uh, today we talk about uh, this question of who's to say, because as often as we've drawn or sought clues about who we are from other people, from our family, from our friends, from our jobs, from our occupations, uh, from where we live, uh, sometimes from the houses we live in or what we make in our lives or what kind of income that comes in. We often try to find our identity in those things. And often those things sometimes can bolster us up, but they change. Uh, I heard someone say years ago, that uh, we all want to be happy and the difficulty about happiness is that happiness depends upon our happenings and if our happenings aren't happening the way we want them to happen then there goes our happiness yeah uh, it blew my mind to think of all those words together but it does sit right doesn't it that happiness is fleeting sometimes and we're often searching for it, trying to find out who we are and how to make happiness work for us. So how do we do it if happenings are dependent upon our happenings? What's happening in the world? What's happening with our family? What's happening with our health? What's happening with our income? What happens um, with, with loved ones so far away? What happens when we have a broken heart? If our happiness depends on the happenings, then you know when our happenings are not happening the way we want them to happen, there goes our happiness. That's a tongue twister for you right there. But hold on to that, that's a thought. The idea that we are in search for happiness or for meaning or finding a sense of who we are from the circumstances around us or people around us or, or the things that we strive for in life that we've been told make for a life, we've discovered that sometimes those things do let us down. Uh, people let us down. Our jobs sometimes let us down. Hey, the world situation lets us down. Pandemics and sickness and all sorts of chaotic moments let us down. And it shakes the very fabric of our foundation of who we are and what we are in the midst of all of this. So we find ourselves that we can't always trust what we see, <laughs> you know, uh, and still believe in who we are. And we can't always trust what we hear and still believe in who we are. And dare I say, we can't always trust what we feel and still believe in who we are 
if those circumstances are so shaky around us. The truth is that we are sometimes, uh, if we are uh, fraud or, or in a place we're not quite sure who we are, um, then our existence sometimes can be fraudulent and unclear. And we never get a sense that we are comfortable in the life that we're living. The only one who could give us some sense of who we are is the one who created us uh, for the purpose in which we exist and our ability to know ourselves very well. Too often we are captivated and we struggle uh, to try to get ourselves free from the vice grip of accidental expectations or societal expectations or the measure for which we find ourselves trying to measure up against another person's achievements, trying to look at stars and those we see on TV to measure our lives and our happiness. Those things we see in social media that says, hey, we're happy when we're taking pictures at dinner or with family or on a vacation, really don't tell the real story behind those those pictures and how the family or the people got to where they are or whether or not they are really happy at all. It's a false measure. measure. And so we're called to recognize that uh, who's to say that these things are, are what it is. And the world in which we live heavily leans on us to say that they're not what they seem to be because our lived experiences lead us to a place where we find ourselves struggling with the difficulties and the dangers of life more often than the joys and the successes of life, or at least so it seems. So who's to say what successes or what achievements uh, are important to have a good life? If it's not you speaking from your own truth and your own identity from the creator who gave you life and gives you life daily, it may be a false representation of what's important in your life. Who's to say um, that our best days are behind us rather than before us and that there's no hope for a better tomorrow before us when we look at the world in which we see? Who's to say that we will not be uh, better uh, tomorrow than we are today, and that this may not be the best day of our lives or the best week of our lives, uh, rather than looking behind us reminiscing about what used to be. Billy Joel uh, used to sing a song and he said something like this, you know, the good old days weren't always good and tomorrow isn't as bad as it seems. In other words, we are in a place where we don't get a chance to question whether or not what we thought we believed about the day or the moment or our future is really accurate unless we test it. Who's to say that these things that are not important are important? Uh, there is a passage of scripture that I want to share with you. It's a wonderful story, a wonderful passage of scripture, uh, rather. Uh, it comes from the 16th chapter of the Gospel according to John. And I'm only going to lift up uh, the latter portion of that 16th chapter, almost the last few verses of that chapter. You can read the pericope or the passage is from the 25th verse through the 33rd verse of the Gospel of John, the 16th chapter of the Gospel of John. But this part is important, I think. Uh, and I'm going to pick up at just a few verses here at the very end. Jesus answered them, do you believe? And indeed the hour is coming, yes, and now has come, that you will be scattered each to his own and will leave me alone, he says to his disciples. And yet I am not alone because the Father is with me. These things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world, you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Uh, those are the last few verses there. I believe it starts at the 31st verse and goes through the 33rd verse, but I do want to lift that up because I think uh, the context is important. Jesus is talking to his disciples about what life is going to be like next. He knows he's on his way uh, to die. And he's aware that they are troubled by that fact. They're hoping that something happens miraculously to change the inevitable. 
But the inevitable always happens. And like most of us know, eventually, eventually happens. And so that he finds himself talking to them and trying to encourage them in the midst of all of these things. They believed him in all the miracles he had done, but they did not quite understand his parables and what he was trying to teach them. But at this point, he now is talking to him clearly about what's about to happen, and they appreciate his honesty. And he, they say to him, we believe you now. And he asked the question, do you really believe me? Well, don't worry about it, whether you do or not. Trouble is going to come to challenge and to shake whether or not you believe what you really believe. And in those moments, he says to him, I have come for this reason, and I've spoken these things to you, so that in me, in a world full of chaos and trouble, you'll still have peace. For in this world, you will have tribulation, you will have trouble, difficulty will be here. And for many of us, we think the world is in a place as if now is the only time it's been in trouble. It's been in trouble for many people for a long, long time. And most of us experience what we understand as tribulations, trials and difficulty that don't seem to have a ready solution. But he says to them, who's to say that that's the end of it. Who's to say that what you see on the daily news is all that there is? Who's to say that what the reporters are talking about in our political situation in the environment is all that there is? Who's to say that war is looming on it over the earth and we are destined to destruction? Who's to say that with climate change, climate change actively changing the landscape of our world, that there is no more hope for the rest of us? I would dare say that even in our own lives, whether it be macro or micro, whether it's your family or the loss of a loved one or the loss of a job or loss of your own hope or loss of your dreams, or you decide and discover that everything that you had worked for, uh, as someone once said, you've been climbing up the ladder of success only to get to the very top and discover that it's leaning up against the wrong building. Whatever that is, it does not conclude or mean that the conclusion is that it is over for you or your best days or your best hopes are behind you. Who's to say that a focused life, a life that is focused in a world, cannot find a way to make it through all the chaos? Who's to say that a life that is faithful and 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 meaningful, and that you've committed yourselves with loyalty to something that is bigger than you is not worth your effort or your time. Who's to say that a life that is finds leads us to a place where we are trying our best to try to make it through or to try to engage a world or to try to engage one another in a meaningful way, not just focused, not just faithful, but in a fruitful way, that in a world full of emptiness and barrenness and sickness and death, that their life cannot come again. We know it is marked in a moment where winter comes, but after winter, spring always comes. And we have discovered that that is true from life lessons. Who's to say that even being free in a world full of oppression, suppression, repression, depression, that life cannot spring from it and freedom cannot be had. Well, I wanna let you know that whatever the world around us says, there's more to it. Who's to say that in the midst of all that we are facing, there's something not worth having. After everything, there's something good that comes. So who's to say that something cannot come out of nothing <laughs> that creative t creativity cannot come out of chaos, that healing cannot come out of hellacious circumstances. The proof that miracles can come out of mistakes is you. You've survived. You are amazing. And somehow with everything you've experienced, the mark of your creator is on you because you keep on making it through. Alfred Lord Tennyson wrote a poem that I remember being recited to me as a young African-American kid living in St. Louis, going to St. Louis public schools. 
And there, uh, my teacher, I can't remember all of it, but I may have mentioned it some years ago. It was in, entitled uh, Flower in the Crannied Wall. And it says something like this, Flower in the Crannied Wall, how I, wonder, how I wonder what you are, root and all. It spoke of a flower that was somehow broke through the concrete on one side of a wall and found a crack in the wall, discovering that the wall kept the sunlight from feeding the flower. But the flower was so desperate to be able to live and to have vibrancy in life that somehow it made its way through the cracks in the wall and it bloomed on the other side of the wall. Some of us, many of you, many of our grandparents and parents, aunts, uncles, cousins, loved ones, friends, those around us, but most importantly, our own journey has led us to know that we've survived walls in our lives by making our way through the cracks only to bloom on the other side. Now I feel like a preacher, really, because I think it's really important to know that no matter how difficult or how dark or how hard or how strange the circumstances we're in, we have the ability to bloom on the other side of the wall. And this, my friends, is a message of hope. Let me finish here and I'll stop. I don't want to go too long. But one of my favorite things I discovered years ago, I, I loved jazz. And one of my uh, favorite uh, uh, jazz artists uh, is jazz trumpeteer Miles uh, Davis. Miles Davis is a, uh, a native of St. Louis, Missouri, in fact. And the greatness of Miles Davis uh, to me was not just in his magnificence uh, as a musician and his skill uh, in, in his ability to compose music, uh, but the greatness of Miles Davis was that in the fact that he had this undefinable character and this ability to take what seemed to be a mistake in musical note and he would play and hit a high-pitched off-pitched note that didn't seem to go with the other notes uh, that he had already played and everyone would assume that he had made a mistake however the notes that follow the supposed mistaken note would then turn the mistaken note into a masterpiece. In other words, he took what seemed like a mistake and then crafted it in such a way with what happens after it so it seemed so masterful and yes, indeed, a masterpiece. That is the way I believe our creator joins us in our journey. Those things that come up in our lives Prove to us that who's to say that what seems like a miracle cannot be a masterpiece or, or it seems like a mistake cannot be a miracle and a masterpiece. That's what I meant to say. What seems to be a mess up uh, can actually turn into the most miraculous thing in your entire life. But if you dwell on the mess up or dwell on the hardship or dwell on the difficulty, you'll never get to see the flower blooming on the other side of the crannied, cracked wall. In other words, stay in the fight. You'll discover who's to say that you won't be the victor. Who's to say that you won't come out better than you went in? Who's to say that joy cannot be had after sorrow? Someone wrote it somewhere that weeping may endure for a night, but who's to say? Joy does come in the morning. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for giving us these moments with you. You have blessed us today. Uh, I'm encouraging you this week, uh, live uh, with the question, who's to say that this thing can't turn around? Who's to say that a miracle is not possible? And who's to say that even if we have to go through the valley, that we won't come out on the mountain someday? Have a great day and have a great week.